coming up, I test the Opus Discovery. I play some games and end with a type in. Let's get on then. Disk systems for the Spectrum, you think, were a bit of a rarity. That is, until you start looking for them. There are over 10 different types, some of which, like the Cyborg, never quite made it, and others, like the Swift Disk, seem to have mutated into other things, if you believe YouTube videos. There were the better known ones that I have reviewed, such as the excellent Kempston Disk Interface, the Plus D Disk Interface, and the lesser known SP DOS Interface. All of these came as a separate, small interface, into which you plugged your external drive. Some had pass-through ports, some had snapshot buttons, and all could use 5.25 or 3.5 inch drives. Only one system comes to mind when thinking about a full, all-in-one disk interface, and that's the Opus Discovery 1. Released in April 1985 and selling for £199.95, let's just call that 200 shall we, it was designed to fit around the original 48k rubber keyed model, although the Plus and 128 do fit. The dawn of a new beginning for your Spectrum, the advert declared, boasting features such as 3.5 inch disk drive, peripheral connector, parallel printer port, joystick interface and video monitor output. Although looking impressive, there was very little technical detail in the advert. For example, the capacity of the drive or the video output type. Later in the year, the adverts gave more snippets of information, in the form of small inset pictures. By this time the magazines were reviewing it, so if you were interested in getting one, you could read what they had to say first. The adverts claim the unit used the very latest Japanese 3.5 inch drive, giving 250k of storage, and also that it had a large selection of software. Now I can't quite see what those are, but they look to be on cassette and I don't recall any official titles being produced for the system. The following year, March 1986, the price was reduced to 149.95, and by the end of its commercial life, at the back end of 1986, you could pick one up for just 99.95. I'd always wanted to get my hands on one of these back in the day, but the price just made it impossible. Jumping forward to 2023 though, and I finally managed to get one, but the price was still very high. Let's take a look. The Opus Discovery is a heavy metal box that contained its own power supply, along with the aforementioned features. A composite video output, a through port, a Kempston compatible joystick port, and a parallel printer port. And let's not forget the main feature, a 3.5 inch disk drive capable of holding 178k after formatting. Mm, the adverts were saying 250, a little bit of hype there. It was built to allow a small television to sit on top, and looked really nice. Later, an upgrade model was released that contained a second drive capable of more storage, although it needed an updated ROM and RAM chips. You could send your Model 1 back for an upgrade at a cost of 139.95, but bought on its own, the Model 2 would cost you 329.95. It's a fine looking piece of kit, and very heavy. On the right hand side you will find a pass-through port, the printer port and the joystick port. On the back is the composite video out and the power switch. The Spectrum fits snugly, and the manual does tell you to use longer screws to secure it to the base for better stability. If you also have leads from your cassette going in, which you will, the connection is not fully home, so you have to be careful. You could always use an extender cable though for long term use. When I put my TV on top of this, the disk drive had problems inserting and ejecting disks, so for now I'm going to just stand it on something behind it. Using the built in composite socket on the Opus, it was time to turn things on. With a satisfying click, I get the standard Sinclair screen, although the signal is not brilliant. I then realise that this is a mono output. Colours just show grey. This now brings me to a test that I was planning to do much further on in the review. Does the pass-through port work with things like the ZX HD interface? After carefully plugging it in and turning it on, yes it does. Although the reset button of the ZX HD is tricky to get to, I had to use a small screwdriver. At least it fits quite neatly to the case though. On to the review then, formatting a disk. You slide in a disk, and use the standard Sinclair microdrive commands. About 20 seconds later, we can do a cat, 
and see how much storage we have. As you can see, we have 178k. This is the first version with the lower capacity drive. I loaded in a typing game using the CAS unit, a game in two parts, one for the graphics and one for the game. I changed the code to use the opus commands and saved both parts out. It saves quite quickly too and doing a cat shows the files. Loading it back in and yes, much faster than tape. Next I set about copying some more type-ins to the disk, and this is where I hit a problem. Saving one or two files was fine, but then trying to save three or four just came up with disk I.O. errors. I tried many different disks, many different games, over many months, and each time the same thing happened. Very annoying. I managed to get Birds and the Bees copied across because it's only two files, so at least we can do a speed test. The game loaded, with an average across five loads, of about 19 seconds. Not particularly fast, but much faster than tape, and just a bit slower than a microdrive. Obviously though, you get much more storage on disk. But this still leaves us with a problem. Why can't I save more than three files? I purchased the upgrade kit from Byte Delight, which comes with a brand new ROM, additional RAM, and a brand new floppy drive. I stripped it all down, set it all up, turned it on, and the drive tried to read the disk, but failed. I then swapped back to the old drive, keeping the new ROM and RAM in place, but that worked like it had before, saving two files and then nothing. I asked a few technical people for help, but after following their advice, things like checking the voltages, which were fine, a nice clean 5 and 12 volts, cleaning the heads, and checking the drive belt, and it still would not write more than two files. The drive formats, so the stepper motor does travel the full length of the disk, but it just won't get past two files. Oh no. I can at least explain the other functions, even though I've got a half working device. The other microdrive commands also work, but have different features. The move command, for example, allows you to copy a file, using drive 3 as the destination. If you've got a basic program that saves out data files, you can load these directly to screen using the move command as well, which may or may not be useful. Now onto the problem that most disk systems have, and that is how to get games onto them. The Plus D had a snapshot button, but the Opus does not. But it does have a pass-through port though, which gave me an idea. Do you think I could use it with a multiface? Not wanting to have both the ZX HD and the multiface plugged in together, just in case, I swapped to the mono composite output just for the process of getting a game onto disk. I turned it on, pressed the button, and nothing. Hmm. I tried the extender cable, nothing. I tried multiphase 3, and nothing. Now we know that the port works because the ZX HD works. I even tried using a Mirage microdriver, and still nothing. So the only way I can think of to get games onto disk is to use a modern tool Snap to Tap. On the PC, I loaded a game, saved it out as a snapshot, converted it to a tap file, which I can then modify to work with the Opus. I did this with Jetpack, and it didn't take long to get the game on because the file's about 8k anyway. I merged the loader, changed the load commands, saved it out to disk. I loaded in the code, saved it out to disk fine. Did a cat, and then got a disk I.O. error. Now, now we're back at this again. Anyway, moving on. The joystick port then. This uses IN31, so it's Kempston compatible. But first you have to turn it on using a format command, which seems a bit odd. And then something weird happened. The corrupt disk with Jetpack on it suddenly began to work, and I could load in the game and test the joystick option. It worked fine, and loaded quicker from disk as you'd expect. Next then is the printer interface. Now I thought I had a cable for this, and after a lot of searching I found it, but it was just a little bit too large to fit, which means I can't test the printer sadly. It works with the Sinclair ROM calls like LPrint and LList, so let's assume it works, shall we? On to other features then. Like the microdrive, you can write auto-running programs by saving them out with a certain name, and then just pressing run when you boot up, and this will load that file. That's ideal for making your own menus. The Opus also has a disk compacting routine built in, if you use a disk for a lot of saving and loading and erasing, the data can become fragmented. 
So using the command move D semicolon one to D semicolon one, we'll do a mini defrag for you. I didn't want to risk this on any of the disks that I had working. As mentioned previously, you can buy upgrade kits from Byte Delight. Sadly, mine didn't work as we've seen, but that's probably down to the Opus. It does provide a higher capacity disk drive and new ROM and RAM chips though. But you do need to open the unit up, take out the chips, and in some cases drill extra holes in the case to mount the drive. But this review is just for the original configuration. I think it shares a problem with other disk systems. Getting games onto disk is probably the primary use, and if it doesn't work with a multi-face device, then that's going to be a problem for a lot of users. Coming from a cassette though, back in the day, this would have been superb, although very expensive. At least for the first year of release. A great bit of kit then, and it's just a pity that mine doesn't work properly. The Spectrum had many compilations, some in normal cassette boxes, some in small clamshells, some in cardboard boxes, and some in larger cardboard boxes. But a few came in special packaging, like this one, and it looked very impressive. This is the Tengen Trilogy, released by Demark in 1990. As you can see from the cover, it has three games, for both the Spectrum and Amstrad. And this was a special edition just for the Home Computer Club, appearing on the front cover as a special deal for subscribers, and inside was a double page offering the compilation for 1999, apparently a saving of £6. The three games are Cyberball, Clax and Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters. One I hadn't heard of, one was a variation of columns or that sort of thing, and one was an absolutely brilliant game on the 16-bit machines. All three were released in the arcades as well. So let's begin with Cyberball. Welcome to Cyberball. I've never heard of this game, released into the arcades by Atari in 1988. I was expecting something a bit like the Amiga Classic Speedball 2. Well, it's sort of similar, I suppose. It's a futuristic American football style game with robots, set in the year 2022. It seemed so far away back then. You get to choose from different plays and have to execute them, or not, as the case may be. There's crowd noise, speech, decent graphics and some good sound effects. I wouldn't have considered this a typical arcade game though. The Spectrum version, released in 1990, requires 128k, as do all titles in this compilation. It has a nice tune playing in the intro screen. And once we get into the game, we get graphics that are monochrome and appear very slow. Especially after playing the arcade version. The scrolling is very jerky, but let's get onto the game itself. After selecting your teams, you first select a play type, running, passing or option. You then select one of the plays given to you, and then you have to try and execute that play. Anyone who watches or is familiar with American football will instantly be at home here. Once you get onto the pitch, you can run the play. If you selected a pass play, you will see targets on the field where you have to get to to be able to catch the ball. You control the receiver, and if you can get to the target before the quarterback gets hit by the defence, you will catch the ball and have a chance to run. If you select a running play, the ball is given to whichever running back you select, and then you have to try and move up the field without being hit by the defensive players. I found it much easier to pass than run, and had more success, if you can call it that. When playing defence, you select the defensive play, and you can pick a player to control and all you have to do is try and get to the ball or quarterback as soon as possible. The graphics are murky, and sort of melt into a pixelated mess when two or more players join together on the pitch, and it makes it difficult to see what's happening. In American football, you have to gain 10 yards in three plays to be able to move on. In this game, the 10 yard marker is called the diffuse line, and if you don't get there in three plays, the ball explodes, 
killing whoever is holding it at the time. Also, if the same player is tackled too many times, he may also explode, so make use of your different players for different plays to avoid this. When selecting plays, you also have a time limit. You can take timeouts like American Football and have a better look at the options. The controls are very sluggish. In fact, the whole game is very slow indeed, which is a pity. Sound is okay. There's a few nice jingles with some white noise to represent the crowd and a few pings here and there. I think this game is trying to be two things at once when it should really concentrate on being one. It's either got to be a strategy game where you pick the plays, call the plays and watch it run out, or it's an all-in action game where the plays are already chosen and you have to go for it. As it is, the mix doesn't feel right, especially at this speed. On to the next game then and Clax. And I think most of you have heard of this game and have probably played a version of it at some stage in your life. Released by Atari into the arcades in 1990, this is a simple, easy to play, yet addictive puzzle game where the action never stops. Coloured blocks move towards you on a conveyor belt and your job is to catch them and place them in piles of the same colour in varying patterns. As with most types of these games, initially the pace is easy and you can join the blocks horizontally, vertically and later on diagonally and when you connect three in a row, they vanish, making room for more. There are other mechanics too, like stacking blocks on the collection arm or flipping them back up the conveyor belt. Colourful, if blocky graphics hide some nice gameplay here and there are some good effects and samples. On to the Spectrum version then, originally released in 1990. We get a similar screen layout and the gameplay is the same. I don't think you could have gone wrong really, simple mechanics converted over to the Spectrum well. Obviously with limited colours, the tiles look more vivid, but they are easy to identify because of this. Sometimes it gets tricky to see which blocks are stacked because the tops of the blocks have been drawn to look a bit three-dimensional, which can, in the panic of the game, look like there are two blocks. The arcade had more colours to use, so this wasn't a problem there. As the blocks move down towards you, they make a clicking sound, just like the arcade. But there's no use of the volume, which is a bit of a pity, as that added an extra element of panic as the volume got louder, the blocks would get closer. We do get sound effects and musical jingles, which you would expect for a 1 to 8k game. Despite my comments though, the game is really well done, and the gameplay is close to the arcade counterpart. You would not be disappointed if you bought this expecting the same thing as you got in your local arcade. On to the last game then, Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters. Released in the arcades by Atari in 1989. Planet X has been taken over by the evil Reptilons, enslaving humans to build more robots. Your mission is to rescue them and destroy all of the Reptilons. The game is 3D stroke isometric and plays a bit like a 3D version of Robotron. You shoot the robots who leave behind crystals, collecting these will increase the power of your laser. Around the level are, for some reason, bikini clad women that you have to rescue and to do this you bump into them. You can also interact with other various things along the way. Switches turn on moving stairs, Food cupboards give you health, etc. A frantic game, lots of action, sprites, music and sound. There are also different sections like navigating a maze on a cyber sled and of course boss battles. The Spectrum version was released in 1990. 
and it uses monochrome graphics. And it does look a bit like a black and white version of the arcade game, and all the sprites are very well defined, as are all the graphics in the game. The intro is included, but sadly lacks the brilliant Amiga soundtrack. Remember that? Moving on and onto the game. I felt let down when I saw it at first because there's no scrolling. This is a flip screen game, which loses some of the feeling of progression really. You can't see what's coming up, you just flip onto the next area and you are met with whatever is waiting for you. This takes away route planning and also means you can walk straight into enemies you don't even see until it's too late. The use of rotational controls, like the arcade, always feels wrong to me on the Spectrum, but eventually I managed to get the hang of it, sort of. I still found myself dropping off the edge of the platform and having to climb back up though. Gameplay is really good, and is less frantic than the arcade version, which is a good thing for me, considering those awkward controls. When playing it on a real Spectrum, the controls were far better, somehow less responsive than an emulator, and that made the game even more enjoyable. The pace is slower, and I enjoyed playing this more so than the arcade. When a lot of sprites are on the screen at the same time, it can slow down, but overall this is an excellent conversion. The room layout and game map is not 100% the same as the arcade, but that doesn't really make it any worse. The graphics are excellent, with some nice character animation. The player flops to the floor, cartoon style when killed, and climbs back up after falling off the edge. All nice touches. Sound is used well too, and even though it would never match the arcade, it still plays music and effects throughout the game. Missing is the Cyber Sledge section which is a bit of a shame, but the boss battles are present. And here you use the bombs you collected from the cabinets you blasted earlier to destroy the huge robot. After each stage you are told how many people you rescued and then it's on to the next one. Once I got used to the controls, more or less, I got quite far into the game, passing four bosses and still rescuing people. I really enjoyed this game, a brilliant achievement and well worth playing. This is Area 51, released in 2023 by Ferrillo Productions. This is an adventure that uses multiple choice to allow you to work your way through the game's challenges and mysteries. Starting in your motel room, after seeing a woman in the bar, you'll soon get to Area 51. Getting any further though is troublesome. Meanwhile, back at the bar, the story begins to unfold. Using excellent graphics and a small font, the game looks really nice, and the steady pace makes it a relaxing game to play. Options open up after visiting places or interacting with objects, locations and people. Working your way through the many paths and options is part of the charm, and the interesting story is worth exploring more. A nice game then.
At the 1988 Winter Olympics, a new star was born, Eddie the Eagle Edwards. Eddie was a British ski jumper, and if you know anything about England, you'll know that ski jumping is almost impossible anywhere in the country, especially if you want to represent your country at the Olympics. Despite finishing last in all his events, with very poor scores, he became an instant celebrity around the world. He later went on to chat shows and after dinner speaking, and he even appeared in adverts for spectacles. He was seen as the epiphany of never giving up and following your dream. A film was made about his story, and he even had a number two hit song in the Finnish charts. He did other songs too, like Fly Eddie Fly. In 1989, Loracles released Eddie Edwards' Super Ski, depicting a skier on the inlay, which Eddie was not known for. Reading the details in the game also includes other events such as slaloms. Anyway, there's a practice mode to help you get used to the controls, which are very tricky, and there are four events in total. The first one then is the slalom. Here you control the player. Eddie or not, it's not quite clear, although you do enter your name at the start. Anyway, you hurtle down the hill and you have to keep in between the flags. You can control the speed from either too fast to almost too fast to not quite as fast, as well as moving left or right. The game can move very quickly too, which is impressive, but impossible to control. The only problem with that is moving slower means you get worse times. After two runs, you come to the next event. It's the... Ah, the giant slalom then, so same as last time, but bigger. Yes, it's the same thing. You go down a hill and get in between the flags. I think this event is slightly faster though. After two runs of that, we can move on to the next event and... Ah, the downhill race. It's the same game, but faster, and with less flags. The landscape does have bumps and hills, but the speed often makes it impossible to control. All of this is in silence. There is not a single sound in the game. Why? Surely there's enough room for sound, even if it meant the game running slower, which, to be honest, might have improved it. After a few runs of that, we finally get on to the ski jump. Here, you ski down a rather short ramp, and when you take off, you use left and right controls to get the angle correct and then try and land, which is very difficult. After two of these, you're given your score, and then the game starts again. I don't think the game does justice to Eddie. Three of the events he didn't even do, and the ski jump is far too short. The game could have been any anonymous ski game, really. Having Eddie's name on it didn't really do it any favours, but I suppose it gave the man some promotion, and it gave the company a celebrity to use when trying to sell the game. For this type-in, I'm going to do something different, but let's get on to that later. First of all, let's introduce it. This is Frogger Jr., published in Sinclair Programs from July 1985 and written by Nicholas Taylor. It's a small listing, which is ideal for what I'm planning. A comment in a previous video suggested I take a type-in and then improve it. Well, let's check out the game first, as it appears in the magazine. After correcting a few errors and a few typos, I got it working. It's a simple game. You move a tadpole up and down, and you have to eat the algae that moves across the screen. If you miss, bacteria is fired at you many, many times. But you can hide behind the barrier at the bottom of the screen until it's done, and then the algae starts again. You can press zero at any point to get an energy report. And at the start, you are asked for a level, which moves the left-hand algae wall closer, making it more difficult to get the algae because you haven't got enough time. Yes, it's a simple game, and it will be available to download from my website shortly. But how can we improve this, going back to the previous comment? Well, where do we start? First of all, the colour scheme. Cyan is not pleasing, so I'll change that to blue. That means having to change all the print routines. The layout of the intro screen is terrible, and uses capitals so we can sort that out. 
runs into the game and it looks a bit bland, but then again it's a typing. A bright asterisk on the left looks bad and, and there's no ground. The base is built from a graphic character and yet yeah, needs a bit of work. The next thing I did was to add a skyline. And to do this I needed more user definable graphics. I also used them to create the bottom of the river. With the skyline and bottom of the river taking up space, I had to change the positions of the algae and bacteria to make sure they didn't wipe anything out. Also, the bacteria fires too many times and it takes ages for it to finish, so I've reduced this to just 10 shots, which is much better. Sometimes the algae and bacteria could overwrite the screen and the level text, so I fixed that as well. I swapped the text to lowercase and finally added some more sound. And I went to the levels. The original asked for a level at the start, but you could never move from that level. So I removed that option altogether and added a level increase, so every 100 points you move on to the next level and the wall of weed where the algae comes from moves closer. I also removed the need to press zero to see your energy. No point in that, I just added it to the top of the screen. Quite a few changes then. And for the final cosmetic improvement, how about a new font? Right, let's see how it all looks. Well, there it is much better in my opinion, and it's still a basic game, rewritten in a few hours.